Thank you for this wonderful invitation uh, to speak with you. I'm just delighted to be talking to such a wide range of students from around the world on a really important topic, which is how do we enhance our ability to educate people around the world uh, in this digital environment that we all find ourselves. So to start with, let me see if I can share the screen with my slides uh, so that we can talk through this topic together. Here we go. Okay. So the title of this talk is Reward, Motivation, and Challenges for Learning. And let me maximize the screen. Okay. So what does licking an ice cream cone, a moment of intimacy, and solving a problem, what do these three things have in common? What they have in common is that they engage, they tickle our reward systems, which are deep in the brain, under our frontal lobes, deep in among the earliest parts of our evolutionary brain. Now we can think of rewards in two ways, which is that there is a wanting system. This is an incentive system. This is a system that lays out our desires. And in the context of education, this is our desire, our wanting to learn. There's also a liking system, which is really about the pleasure. In the context of education, this is the pleasure we get from learning. Now, it turns out that our brains are designed to enjoy and get reward from learning. So infants, start out being very curious about the world. They're constantly trying to understand what it is uh, that they are seeing around them. And children get great joy in acquiring new information. So the system is really designed, our biological systems are designed to get pleasure from learning. And if you are in an educational system where students are not enjoying the information they're getting, the learning, we are doing something profoundly wrong. Because again, our biological systems are designed to get pleasure, to get enjoyment from learning. If we think about learning itself, what are the motivational states? What is going on in us that allows us to learn. And we can think of two different motivational states. One is curiosity and the other is interest. Now these two terms, curiosity and interest, are sometimes used interchangeably, but it's worth thinking of them in somewhat distinct ways. So what do I mean by curiosity and what do I mean by interest? You can think of curiosity as the initial trigger where someone realizes that there's something they don't know, there's a gap in their information, and they want to close that gap. And so curiosity is the trigger, the state we're in when we wish to close that information gap. Interest, on the other hand, is related to curiosity but is a more sustained engagement with the topic, that it is not quickly solved by a simple piece of information. And then interest itself can be of two kinds. There can be situational interest, which is engagement with the topic because of the specific context in which one is encountering this topic. And then this interest can be driven internally so that people develop an individual interest. So let me give you an example. Let's say I meet someone who doesn't know me 
and they ask me my name. And I tell them my name is Sanjan Chatterjee. They were curious about who I was. There was an information gap. They get my name. Uh, and one of two things can happen, which is they stop. Now they know my name and it, their curiosity is sated, is satisfied. They don't go on into developing further interest. On the other hand, it could be that the person thinks that, oh, that's a name that is not something I have encountered. I'm not familiar with this kind of name. And they ask me where I'm from. And I say, I immigrated from India when I was a boy. Uh, they might uh, ask me some questions about my experience as an immigrant. They might ask some questions about my childhood in India. So here we've gone from curiosity to interest and the interest itself remains situational because it is in the context of having a conversation with me. On the other hand, they may go on and think about India and think that they don't know much about uh, the history or the culture of India and then uh, choose to explore that further. So now the interest has shifted the interest has shifted from being situational in which I am the context of their interest into an individual interest. And ultimately, ultimately, this is what you want an educational system to do, which is to use people's curiosity, perhaps to use situational context, but ultimately drive their interest into relevant topics, drive their interest internally. Okay, now, if that is the goal, there is a way in which a lot of media doesn't help us. A lot of digital media, a lot of our engagement tends to make us distractible. We're not aware of our surroundings. We bounce back and forth. Uh, and the pleasure we get from it is quite immediate, that there is no sustained engagement often. Not always, but often. And then the content of what we consume can often be rather trivial. You can think of this as a nutritional, uh, with a nutritional metaphor that we are getting empty calories from for our mind in many of these uh, environments. So what is the educational challenge? The educational challenge is how do you sustain interest in a specific topic? And then how do you get that interest to be driven internally so that a person has an internal, internal incentive, an internal desire, an ongoing engagement that is driven internally to try to learn? Now, with this as a challenge, it is worth going back quite some time to some of the ideas that Aristotle had. When Aristotle thought about what um, our rewards, what the rewards in life are, uh, he made this distinction between hedonia and eudaimonia. Hedonia is the immediate pleasure that we get from an experience. But he thought eudaimonia was something a little more profound, a little more sustaining. And eudaimonia was Aristotle's way of thinking about what it means to live a good life, what it means to live a life of virtue, what it means to have a deep, a profound sense of wellness or well-being. Wellness itself has become an important idea, an important construct in our culture. Um, and when we think about wellness or well-being, we think about it in terms of very specific practices. So you can think about yoga, you can think about meditation, you can think about exercise. These are practices that people engage in in order to feel good. There is a deep sense of 
wellness of well-being that comes from these kinds of regular practices. Now it's notable, it's notable that in these practices, there is no external reward, right? We are not doing these kinds of practices in order to get a prize or get a lot of money. And so this is the challenge of how do you drive incentives, this sense of reward, but the reward is internal, uh, with these kinds of practices, and how do we take that, this idea, into an educational context? There may be many ways to do this, but let me suggest one that already exists in many, uh, in, in many learning environments. That is our involvement with art and aesthetics. Art and aesthetics Sometimes people talk about this as art for art's sake, as though this is a bad thing. And I would like to suggest that maybe it's not. Maybe it is a vehicle, a tool to drive our rewards, our incentives internally, so that when you engage in the production of art, when you engage with uh, artworks themselves, where there's no immediate reward, you're just trying to figure out what is going on here, how do I understand this, the kind of pleasure one can get uh, from understanding uh, what is happening uh, in art, that maybe this is an educational way that we can use to try to drive people's reward systems, a practice in which people can start to learn about their own incentive uh, their own internal incentives and their own internal rewards. And what happens in many uh, educational systems, certainly in the US, uh, is that when we have education, when we have funding cuts, the first things to go are art and aesthetics and music. I think this is a mistake. So to summarize, this is my challenge to you if you want to create an educational environment by digital means, which is how do you get people, how do you use people's curiosity to then have them engage over a sustained period of time? How do you expand the duration of engagement with the topic? And then ultimately, how do you get the source of their rewards to be driven internally so that they can become lifelong learners, which is that this basic idea, the basic design of our brain that we enjoy learning, we enjoy acquiring new information is allowed to flourish completely. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, this is my challenge to you. And I hope uh, that you, the brightest of the world's uh, youth, can figure this out because this is really important. It's really important for us to have people who wish to learn who are lifelong learners. Thank you very much. <laughs>